There are multiple ways to keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast through our Instagram handle, the Wolf Connection Pod. And for comments and questions, send us an email to podcast at wolfconnection.org with your comments, questions, and guest ideas for Stephen and myself. You may hear your question answered on an upcoming podcast. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. Let's talk about some more. It is a great pleasure to welcome back a friend of the podcast. It's been it's been some time, you know, some stuff has happened since we last spoke. Uh, she is award-winning independent documentary filmmaker. She has two new films that she is promoting that have both uh, they debuted at the Arizona International Film Festival in April of last year. One is Today As I Run, the other is The Wild One, and she is Julia Huffman. Julia, so happy to have you back. How have you been? I've been really good and um, I'm really happy to be back. And I, I feel like last time we talked, it was really hot too. So I'm thinking it was either last summer or the summer before. I'm, I'm losing track, but we were in the middle, like the deep summer. So here we are again and uh, great to see you both. And um, thanks for, I just want to say before we even get going, thank you for your continued work. I'm mm-hmm. listening to the podcast and you're bringing in amazing, inspiring people. And I just, I really appreciate both your commitment to doing that and, um, you know, just all the work you're doing and all the good information that you continue to spread with your different, um, you know, the different guests you have on your show. So I'm listening and I just want to say how much I appreciate your work. So, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's good to be here. uh, (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. I just got goosebumps there. So I, I appreciate that. We, we, we really appreciate it. And it's, it's been a journey. So we we passed 100 episodes recently and that's wow. Now, yeah, so we just uh I, I don't know. I, it it kind of hit us initially, but now that we're just sort of back in the saddle again and and rolling and we keep going. And I go, "All right, here's 102 and 103 and 104." So it just it's just a thing, but yeah, it's it's been a wild yeah. ride and uh, you were you were actually one I think you were in the first 10 episodes that we did. I think you were number. I think you were actually lucky number seven, if yeah, I remember really... correctly. If my my memories is that good, so, like yeah, yeah. you seven. guys were just starting out. People yeah, now. yeah. You know, and... because I'm, you know, I interview people. I want to interview you both about this, <laughs> but I have to hold myself back because you're supposed. I'm supposed to be the interviewee, but I'm like, I want to <laughs> like jump in and hear about it, you know. But this, no, like, go ahead. 100. I mean, listen. Yeah, I mean, we now. can have. I mean, this is the conversation. So, I mean, yeah. I'm. We're open. If you got questions for us, that's that's great. Did, did you ever see it? Like, did you have an idea, you know, when you jumped in? Like, you know what, we're going to, this is going to continue on? Or was it like really experimental kind of vibe? Or what was your, what did you see when you first jumped in? And how has it changed? There's a question. <laughs> hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think when we first, when we first started, the the goal was pretty simple. It was, how can we help bring the wolf connection experience or, or the experience that we have with wolves? How can we bring that outside of the ranch? Because before that, wolf connection was really focused on, you know, on-site experiences, which is like our bread and butter. And that's like, that's that's the magic that wolf connection is. But when COVID hit, it was like, we, we got to, we got to be creative. We can't, you know, we got to be creative. We got to be able to reach out. We got to be able to continue our momentum and keep building this momentum and not, you know, not succumb to what could have been a long period of sort of like being stagnant and, you know, not doing what we're supposed to do, which is continuing the, the wolf connection work. So John and I being media guys, we were like, Oh, well, this is, that's, that's easy. We got to start a, we got to start a podcast. We know what gear to use. We edit audio, we edit video. Um, John's done radio before. Um, it was kind of like, well, what? I mean, how how could we, how could we not do it? That just makes the most sense. So we started, and I think the first ten episodes, we, I don't know, we didn't. I, I guess in the I guess the main thing that changed, like we didn't really get, yeah. like we yeah. didn't really know what our flow was yet. But that, I mean, that's just that just creates itself basically over time, and now. We are, I mean, we, oh, I think one thing is we thought, oh, how many episodes could we really do this for? Like how many, like how many people could we really talk to and still be getting mm-hmm. fascinating new information? How many people are we really going to find that have something new to bring to the table? And it's like, 
it just never, it just honestly never ends. And every single podcast, every guest just inspires us to a whole new approach to the next episode and like a whole new set of questions that we have. And then they bring in a whole new set of people. I mean, the wolf community is act is insane. It's so big. It's unfreaking believable. You wouldn't believe how many people are out there that specialize in wolf information and wolf studies and wolf biology. It's like, I don't think we, I don't, I don't think we could run out. That is incredible though. Really, truly. I mean, that is so inspiring to think about like how you had your process and how like it expanded your own viewpoint, you know, on what is put, what's possible and how far reaching this thing is. Yeah. 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 I, I think what really hit home for me, just to piggyback what Steven said, I, to your point, Stephen, I, I think, yeah, when we got through the first five or 10 episodes, we, we, we looked at each other and we said, okay, where, where's the next group going to come from? And, <laughs> yeah. what's, and, and listen, to everybody who's been on, hopefully, I, and a lot of them do listen. I mean, yourself included, Arthur Leffo, Ryan Devereaux, I mean, the, the individuals that we've had on recently who said they've been listening from the beginning. For a long time. The, yeah. It's really kudos to them and yourself included, that have really carried the message along. I mean, we could have put this out into the universe and people would have been like, okay, it's just another podcast. But this community and these individuals that we've had on have really carried the message globally. I mean, I I would have never thought that we would have spoke to anybody outside of North America and we've already spoken to two people in Spain. And we've been recommended to speak to someone in Italy. You know, the deep parts of the Yukon. I think this is... It's more than I, I think I would have ever thought. And I think what I, what I also believe was missing from Wolf Connection for a little bit that we are starting to harness more and more is really talking about the mm-hmm. wild wolf aspect and about the, the bills that are happening, the, the community mm-hmm. that's out there mm-hmm. trying to bridge the gaps between those that might be anti-wolf, but not for the reasons that everybody thinks. And I think that's a very valuable yeah. um, way to bridge that gap is to bring these people on and say, hey, we're, we're all in this together. We're all connected. This is something that we can all work together on and really coexist yeah. in a way that we probably haven't since we've settled the American West um, in that right. way. So I think it's, right. it's yeah. such a far, yeah, it's it, it, like Stephen said, it's growing by leaps and bounds every day. And the names that we keep getting and the, and the research we keep looking at is just, it blows my mind all the time. Yep. Yeah, me too. Every single time. I'll say one last thing too that I think is important is like, well, first off, we haven't had one guest on this show that I haven't immediately wanted to hang out with afterwards. Like I, we need to get <laughs> to these people. I need to learn more about what they're doing. I need to know more about what's going on with them. I need to get into their life a little bit more. I, I'm just so curious, which is so cool. And they all have amazing stories and they've put in such amazing effort. But I think one thing I really didn't realize until episode like, you know, 15 or something like that is just how important this conversation is and how it, the the wolf aspect of it is so, um, it's such like a fraction of the conversation. Um, it's obviously the vehicle, but it's such a fraction of conversation. It really spans into the conversation that the world is trying to have which is how can we find more common ground? How can, we, how can we work together? How can we not be so divisive about what political party we support and, you know, all these nuanced right. arguments that everyone's having? And it just sort it just, it, it literally, I didn't realize it till, till partway through how important this conversation is because it has, it, it, in it is all the blueprints for creating a space where people can talk stuff out and get ideas out and, and communicate their concerns. And it's kind of like, that's the thing that I personally uh, believed for the last several years, or at least the last eight years that this country very specifically really needed to give, to give more attention to. And then we were like, Oh, well, let's have a podcast about wolves. Cause we know about wolves and we love wolves and we have relationships with wolves. But I didn't realize till ha- part the way through that we were doing a whole other thing. Like it, it wasn't just about, you know, that topic. I think that was, that, that's been my biggest takeaway so far. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And I just want to say that again, I want to come compliment you both on um, that's felt. I really think that's, that is being, um, it's transcending into the work you're doing. 
that kind of global community kind of um, uh, foundation and curiosity that you guys are holding in this evolution that's happening, right? That I just feel like you're creating the space for it and you're holding the curiosity. And like you said, there's a stem of wolf, right? And, and, but also it's, it's, um, it's bigger than that. Yeah, and, it's everything. Mm-hmm. and the beauty too, I think is that it organically happened. So it's really, it feels yeah. really authentic. And I'll just say one more thing, if I could, Yeah. you know, yeah. I'll be doing my own, I'll read an article or, um, somebody, a group will put out information about something a little bit new or something they're working on related to wolves or wilderness and, and things like that. And I'll go, oh my God, I have to go back to Wolf Connection podcast and find that person. <laughs> and I'll just sit there and I'll be like, you know, like I listened to <laughs> Matt Barnes the other day. And Matt Barnes Brad, is awesome. Yeah. Brad, what's Brad's last name? Brad. Orsted? Yeah. Oh, Brad yeah. Orsted, yeah. And I'm just like pulled into these worlds of, yeah, yeah. of other people's mm. lives and story and the interconnected uh, interconnectivity of that desire to um, preserve a, a, a species, right? But, there, but there's all this other life that's happening. It's fascinating, Unreal. right? Yeah, it's just really, really, and I'm, and I'm really pleased you guys are going to keep going, so. Oh, yeah. We're not um, planning on stopping. It, it, it'll be interesting yeah. to see like, you know, where it is now. You know, and then where it keeps yeah. going, right? Because it has gone a long way in a, you know, in a quick period of time. What you're saying is kind of you're thinking globally, you know? Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. And we've got ideas for visuals and, and traveling and doing small documentary stuff. So we've got, we've got, we've got ideas. Right. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. If anything that I can tell, tell you and also tell anybody that's listening is that we, we have so many ideas, fresh ideas new things that are coming to the forefront every day with the expansion of not only the physical ranch at Wolf Connection, but also this tiny, mighty podcast that we, outreach, you know, we're yeah. going to be getting, yeah, outreach. We're going to be getting into video. We're going to be getting into, as Steven said, filmmaking and things like that. So there's a lot more. Traveling that's, podcasts. Traveling podcasts is definitely a thing that's going to happen. Um, and Very it's, cool. it's all, yeah, it's I did all a little bit of that already. Yeah. yeah, we did it in Yellowstone a little bit. We did, but now that we've, I mean, now that we've, we've interviewed so many fascinating people, like I said, I immediately want to go hang out with everybody. Right. And it's right. like, we're just going to eventually find the means to, we're going to eventually find the means to do that. Um, to yeah. just do like a little road trip around, uh, I mean, this, I mean, I mean, it's too many places to mention from Michigan all the way to Washington, you know, just. Oh, Wolf State. T- yep. Tons of, tons of people we need to go see and we'll do some live traveling interview stuff plus some visuals and create a little bit more of like a visual presence at some point but yeah but it's on, it's on. Well, you're laying yeah. the foundation right yeah so, exactly. oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know and you no, know a lot of people now so you <laughs> can only imagine I mean, we, I mean yeah i know we've gotten offers to you know we'll we'll hold you up we'll make sure you guys are are fed and and spain i mean you know stuff like that i mean yeah again if, if you were to told me Two years ago, that just doing a podcast, we would get invited to go watch wolves, Iberian wolves in Spain. I would have thought you were crazy, <laughs> you know. But that's it's an well, offer. It's one of the pins in the are. map for Stephen and I. So here we are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing that COVID. And I mean, you know, uh, it, there was a huge down depressing side of COVID. Yeah, full story exactly. for many many people. And you know, this also inspired a lot of things. I saw your cat just go by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's a. Uh, she, she just kind of scampered by. <laughs> in, in any of the podcasts, either dog or cat roaming behind either of us is <laughs> is a pretty good bet. It's a, it's a safe yep. bet that was somebody else showing. Hiding my dogs for it's that something. reason. Yes, yes. <laughs> our, our families, they're here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Our fur families are everywhere. I mean, for you then, Julia. Let me let's let's get to you though. What what has this been like? Because we it's been a while since you we we've all three of us have talked. What has this period been like for you as a, as a filmmaker, as a researcher, really just getting into the next couple of projects? Because when we spoke the first time, we, took, we spoke about Medicine and the Wolf, and that was your, the big feature. And you were already talking about doing an, another couple of projects. Things get put on hold. So what's that for you like as a creative to have ideas and then everything sort of grinds to a halt and now you have to reposition yourself moving forward. 
Oh boy. Yeah. It's, um, ha, huh. you know, you, you, you have your goals about things you want to create and you start thinking, think things get lined up and then COVID hits. Right. And then everything kind of gets turned on its head. So I too kind of went through, like there was some movement in some areas and then everything stopped. Um, and so I, you know, did a little rethink. I actually went back to school, um, and got my editing certificate. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I've nice. edited, I've edited and, you know, we'll talk about the projects, but I, I've edited like, um, uh, how do I say this? I, I, I was an editor, but like not, a real editor. You know what I mean? Like I could do string outs and I could edit, but there'd always be like, I'd have to find another editor to come in right. and do all the finishing work. And I went, I just said, I was like, you know, I had a little talk with myself. I'm like, I think it's time that yeah. you, you know, you learned all the technical stuff and did your own editing. Like, come on, you're a filmmaker. You know, you can shoot, you can direct, you can produce, you can write. But, you know, so anyway, I went back to school and I got my editing certificate and I really loved it. I mean, I was, I did it all online. And um, once I got past like the fear of going back to school, um, and, you know, just, I don't know, it's been a long time since I've been in school. And uh, once I got over that, um, I was just loving it. So um, I got my editing, editing certificate. And around that same time, I was approached by um, Delia Malone from Sierra Club. And, um, you know, she was talking to me about possibly, you know, me producing and directing a short uh, video for them for their wolf restoration Um you know, tour, educational tour that they're doing in Colorado. And, you know, we just started having a back and forth. And I will say this, like, I just want to make it clear. Anything I talk about today is all, you know, from, from me, you know, I'm not, I'm not speaking for, from another, for another group or entity. This is all coming from yours truly. So I'm going to make sure I say that. Um, but anyway, so we started having a conversation and, you know, I was excited too, because I'm like, you know, I want to edit my own stuff too. So I was like, deep into editing some of my own work at the time. So I was feeling pretty creative. So we started going back and forth about ideas and, um, you know, these two separate short films, uh, came to life through that conversation. And, um, yeah. So, you know, out of some churning and some change and some other projects being like, I have one project, literally I put all the hard drives, organized everything and put nicely and neatly in a box in my closet. Like I literally had a ritual around a project like that needs to be put to the side for now. So it's been some reorganizing of priorities lately. I will go back to that project. It just, I needed to like, let it go for a while. That's a whole other story though. But, um, so I started working on the project, um, with Sierra club and, um, you know, just got really inspired because I had this poem to work from. And, uh, you know, a man named Hank, Hank Seep wrote it um, from Washington State. He's actually has passed. Um, but uh, he wrote this poem and I was approached to do animation. Well, I was actually approached to make create a story from the poem. And I thought about it for a little while and I just kept seeing animation. And so, again, like things were changing for me creatively and I just went, this, I really see this as an animated piece and I, I've never done animation. So it was risky, you know, but I don't think we grow until we take risks. And so I was just in a place to trust myself. Um, been, I've been trusting myself more as an artist. And I just said, this is what I think. What do you think? And so, you know, kind of went back and forth around the animation for a little while. And uh, um, it was approved and I ended up finding this fantastic animator who does stop motion animation. She also works with puppets and she is incredible, Orencia Bedeker. And, um, you know, we co-created the storyboard and pitched the storyboard. And so this was a huge learning process for me, you know, to uh, work with an animation an animator closely on this um, storyboard. But we had the words you know, the poem. Anyway, fast forward to, um, yeah, I started digging in and um, working on these two separate stories. Um, and, you know, the, the, the reason why um, I was asked to, I, I think it's fair to say, is that right now in Colorado, um, they put, you know, wolves, they put wolves on the ballot. Um, they're going to bring, you know, wolves back, you know, they're going to, you know, restore wolves into the wild. Um, this happened in 2020. It was a very small um, 
you know, they won by like 1% or something. They were put on the ballot and, you know, it passed, but, but very, very, um, mm-hmm. what am I trying to say? Narrowly, Little. I guess. Yeah. A very narrow margin. Narrow yeah. margin. Thank you. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's what I was Tiny one. For. Very tiny. Tiny, tiny margin. So there, you know, the, the um, environmental groups have a lot on their plate right now as far as changing public's perception about wolves. And so basically the goal was using these two videos to educate the public and to help mm, inspire, if you will, the public to care about the wolves that they put on the ballot to bring back into Colorado to actually care about the wolves enough that what happened, like, you know, the, the poem was about the profanity peak pack. So, um, so um, what happened with the profanity peak pack and sadly was happening around the country doesn't happen to the wolves that Colorado brings back to their state. So I was honored to be asked to create the two um, separate films, um, you know, just for their educational campaign. So when you were, well, when you were asked to, actually, I'll ask another question first. You mentioned this much earlier, so um, it may seem slightly out of context, but in terms of, well, when I started editing my own footage, it just changed. I mean, something something about it changed drastically, like something about my process and about the way I was inspired to create the film or create the footage changed a lot. And then I just felt so much more satisfied and fulfilled when I had it all in my brain while the shooting was happening. So then when I get back to the editing table, it's just like, I just cruise through it. Did you find that that was the same when, you know, finding yourself more proficient and more competent, did that change the outcome of your projects or the way that you thought about filming them? Yeah, every everything that you said, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's changed everything. It's changed how I plan. It's changed how I film. Um, I see things while I'm shooting now. Um, I feel a lot more confident in trusting my intuition. Um, maybe it's how people, I don't play music, but maybe it's how people feel who create music. There's something else like now that I've got that technical stuff down, which I always resisted. I was like, I know how to edit, but somebody else needs to do the major heavy lifting, you know? But now that I allowed myself to get the technical stuff really down, maybe it's like driving a car, you know, it's like all of a sudden I'm not thinking as much in my analytical brain, but I'm trusting the energy. I'm trusting, um, uh, the, the flow and the beats and, and something else is kind of happening now that I I get more in a zone, you know, where I'm like trusting the flow and the music of something more than I am analyzing and getting caught up in in how to cut something or how to actually, how to actually do something in a scene is not as challenging for me now because I see the possibilities. Coming from the editing background that I come from, I, it's, what I find, because you went the you went the producer director then to edit, so I've I've done the reverse in many ways, and for me, I, I feel you because once you once you edit, and I think Stephen, you agree with this too, is that once you're editing, you can see like this is missing, like something like you can spot the the, the spaces where you're like, mm, if they would have just shot something like this, so it really gives you the the groundwork if you work sort of the back back way out to say, okay, I, I've sat in an any room, you know, suite for hours upon hours upon hours, thousands <laughs> of hours. So I understand, you know, so you start to understand, like you said, Julia, how to shoot when you get to that point, you're like, oh, if I shoot it this way, this is going to flow into the specific space, specific space and things like and that. And John's so done way more editing than anyone I know because he does like <laughs> 10 hours a night <laughs> of editing. So. Oh, really? That's true. Yeah. yeah. No, my other, okay. yeah, my other job, it's... Yeah. So it's, but you just, you get to see if you, if you have all the pieces in place, because when you're getting, and this is the last, I'm not going on a tangent here because I want Steven to get back to his points. But when you see footage that is incomplete in a way where you're cutting certain things that don't, you go, boy, if I just had this angle from this, from this, whatever it may be, and you're left with other options that don't exactly match you feel wanting more and you it almost becomes a little bit of a burden and a a reflection upon you as an editor because you go boy this is i'm only doing what i can with what i have and if i was in charge if i knew you know if i was sitting there with the director or the camera person whatever i would say make sure to get x y and z and you know it would be a more collaborative way to make the thing 
as good as it could possibly yeah, be. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I feel it. I mean, I'm like feeling your pain in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and also like, you know, me too, like, I, I, yeah, like I've sat in the room with the editor, right. And like, you know, and felt the, the stress sometimes and like how all of a sudden it's left to the editor. Right. It's like, you got to fix it. You got to make it, we got to make it sing, you notes, know, notes, like, notes, just notes, do yeah. it, right. Just, just, you know, and it's like, well, sometimes you're left with not all the pieces that you need, you know? So, yeah. So I think too, like, you know, what you were saying earlier was like, um, it helps you in the field. Right. Cause you're like, it's, especially when you're editing, you're like, you need to make sure I get all those things. So yeah, I don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> find my hands when I sit down, you know, and it just gets done so much quicker. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just you're so like, get all that stuff done. Like get all, do all the, do all the cutaways, do all the B roll and, and get a couple more, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I think it's an empowering moment to be able to edit your own stuff. I think it, it changes the whole course of everything, but, um, I think so too. And I get, I've been 10 hours to, I understand uh, to be 10 hours. And I mean, I've been that obsessed editor. So I, yes, <laughs> you get on a roll, you know, <laughs> Like in music, yeah, you're, you're listening to the same kick drum for 17 hours. So we've all been in, we've all, we're all in the same boat, you know? Um, anyway, so we're never when coming you were, out of that room. I know it's hard. It's yeah. hard. Um, yeah, it's hard. Okay. So when you got asked to do these films what was your approach in terms of what were your methods or resources that you used to research, um, you know, the pack and, and, and whatever you needed to kind of come up with a, with a concept, how did you approach it once you were you know, once you had the initial ask. So you're talking about, okay, so we, we're, are we talking about the, the uh, Today As I Run or just yep, in Today today's I Run? Well, yeah, Today As I Run specifically. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, I mean, yeah, whew. this one's emotional for me because, um, you know, I, I follow the story in 2016, you know, when, um, you know, there was a lot of press going on about, and a lot of the groups were talking about environment, bigger environmental wolf groups were, were talking about this. There was a lot of articles written about what was going on in Washington state um, in the national forest when um, a rancher who had actually, you know, been a key player in another wolf pack being annihilated um, in 2012, basically, you know, let, you know, his livestock out in National Forest. And this was right very close by to where the Profanity Peak family lived. And it was a huge um, dilemma, I guess you could call it. So, you know, I had, when I was approached to do this piece, um, Today as I run based on the poem, I, it was emotional for me because I knew a lot about what had happened and I had followed it really closely when it was going on in real time. And I, you know, I remember at one point when the, I think they had um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife had at, called for killing part of the pack, uh, part of the wolf family. And uh, because they had depredated on a few cows, which there's a whole lot there to talk about, right? About whether that was a good idea or not, or the controversy surrounding that issue. You guys might have talked to other people about this, but um, I remember at one point, you know, they had killed some of the some of the wolves, and and there was a you know a lot of groups that were having protests, you know, and I was ready to go to Washington State. I mean, I was so bothered by what happened; it seemed really wrong to me, and unfair, you know, to be allowing for cattle to graze in this uh, forest, national forest, where, you know, endangered wolves lived close by. And in my opinion, the, you know, the, the livestock owner was not taking correct precautions around the issue. And then, and then they started killing the wolves from helicopters. And then eventually they killed most of the pack. So, you know, people were up in arms about this. So I, it, I, I was pretty emotional about it. And I actually, I try not to do this because I'm most comfortable as a creator and as a storyteller. That's where I feel I can best mm, utilize my voice in, in a way that mm, is positive, hopefully, and can create and contribute to some change you know? So that's where I feel like I can do my part to be of service, you know, to the best of my ability. But this time around, I just decided, no, I'm going to speak out. So, I mean, I didn't, you know, I just, I spoke out a little publicly about the issue and, um, and uh, made it clear that I thought it was wrong. 
you know, what was going on. So when I was a pro and, and, and there was a burn, like this burn that stayed with me around it, like this heartburn. So when I was approached about this poem, I went, yeah. And, and I thought the reason why, because it's bringing up like a lot of mm, stuff that is not fun and pleasant to think about, you know, this pack being annihilated by, you know, guys coming in helicopters and, you know, um, you know, shooting wolves that had tracking their collars and shooting a wolf family, including four wolf pups. I mean, it's pretty horrendous to think about. So it wasn't pleasant, but I, to work on it in that way, but I will say I felt a responsibility to do it because I think it's important that we not forget. And so I felt very rooted in, okay, if I can remember this while I'm working on this story, that the reason why I'm doing it is not to like upset people or, you know, create more conflicts in a very, Mm -hmm. uh, in the environmental world, uh, wolf world, which there is, there was a lot of people fighting, right? Still are to the States, a very hot issue in certain uh, circles. So if I can remember that my goal and my focus is to, um, tell a story about something that happened that in my mind was unjust and that we don't want to keep making those mistakes again. But, you know, if we don't remember what happened, um, then we will, we will keep doing this, you know? So that's what I tried to stay harnessed in while I was working on it. And honestly, it was extremely painful. And we talked about, uh, you know, editing, you know, and sitting and looking at stuff over and over again. And, you know, I was giving notes on things and the animator was coming up with, it was really difficult to come up with the scene where, uh, where the wolf got shot. It was really difficult to come up with a scene where the wolf pup was killed. I mean, it was horrible. Um, so I'm going over and over and over the visuals for this. So it's kind of, you know, a bit soul destroying sometimes. Right. But I just thought, okay, I need to remember why I'm doing this, you know, I, because we don't want to forget, you know, so it's like putting it back in people's faces in a sense, but, but it's harnessed in, um, a reason why, you know, yeah. Or just while we're on this, we give some context, maybe some, some of the basics you can fill in the gaps for us. But, um, so here's what, I mean, here's what I understand so far. The Profanity Peak Pack is a wolf pack in Washington that was discovered in 2014, right? Um, Some of the members were radio collared in 2016, and I think they were gone by 2017. Um, There's a rancher being disproportionately targeted, um, which does happen, right? Like, they talk about cattle depredations, but... It's, it's not necessarily like a widespread problem. It's, it's a lot of times it's disproportionately, you know, happening on a very specific ranch in a very specific area. And in this place, this rancher had cows grazing in an area with an active wolf den. His cows are reported to be moving around native prey, which is obviously a problem, and are now being targeted by wolves. Um, they're the last remaining ungulates on the landscape. So at least in that area. And there's somewhat of a refusal to participate in mitigation techniques, which are being offered. Um, so they started to call this pack um, a few wolves at a time as they depredated on a few cattle until they were basically gone. And I think it, I think I read that it costs like $119,000 to get rid of this wolf pack, um, which then it begs the question, like, what are, <laughs> are we saving? Why are you guys trying to save someone money or are you? you know, what's the, what's the goal here, but it, it was an expensive endeavor. Um, so that's what I understand so far. Uh, is there anything else that I'm, I'm missing there? Or is that like the, is that the general? I mean that, I think you did a really good job of, of overall view of it. Yes. And, and, and I'll say this, like, it's a very complex issue to my mind, right? I don't consider myself an expert about it, but I do, I, I will share, you know, what I know and what I feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, um, you know, there are some documentaries out there right now about what happened, which I would definitely recommend if people are, you know, want to, you know, learn more in depth about it. Um, and lots of articles written about what happened to Profanity Peak Pack. But I think for me, like a couple of things stand out around the story. One thing is um, 
in that area, and this is really common in the rest of the United States, but in Washington, right, we have however many hundreds of thousands of acres of national forest, right? Then we have a million cattle, and then we have 90 wolves. And we have 90 endangered wolves. They're on the endangered species, right? So in relationship, like if you think about that story there and you think about Colorado and what Colorado are trying to bring wolves back and reinstate wolves and they're in the middle of putting together their wolf management quote unquote plan, you know, I think that we can look to Washington state and how that all went down and go, okay, um, we don't need to be killing, we don't need to be killing wolves when we are putting livestock basically on top of them in national forest, right by where their den is, right? We don't, how are we, how are we going to restore wolves back on our landscape? If this is the kind of protocol that we think is a good idea, that we end up like taking out a whole wolf pack when there's some issues with cattle being killed in national forest, right? Where in my mind, we should be allowing the 90 wolves that live in Washington state, they need to have territory to exist, right? So in my mind, we need to be managing more. <laughs> this is so, it's, it, it, you can just keep going with it. But in my mind, you know, we need to be managing more of the livestock, the million livestock, than we need to be killing the endangered wolves that are trying to survive in areas where we're bringing in cattle that are dispersing the deer and elk that they prey upon, right? So it's like, I feel that we, you know, people have talked about this before, but I feel like we're setting up wolves to fail with this kind of protocol. And we don't want to keep, right? And we don't want to keep doing that again, but this is what, you know, a lot of groups decided was a good idea, right? And I think if you, and I don't know, you know, this is, there's so much here, guys, right? But yeah, of course. You know, if yeah. you think about what Colorado is trying to do right now, which is set up a wolf restoration plan that's going to succeed, um, I think, I feel like um, we need to rethink, like, if it, uh, A, putting wool, uh, putting livestock in areas where we want wolves to thrive right? B, how we're going to manage those livestock, you know, um, C, do we want to, we, I think we've learned that killing wolves doesn't solve the problem with, with Deborah, you know, wolves killing livestock. It makes it worse that we could talk about that too. But I think that when we think about the management in Colorado, we need to come up with new ways to um, deal with to not use the age old, age old way we've been dealing with cows and wolves. It's not, we're not going to restore wolves back in the wilderness if we keep doing that. That's my opinion. You know, we're just going to keep killing them and bringing them back and killing them. And bring, And I don't think, I, I think that's, um, I think we're, um, we're learning that that's not the way, you know, ethically, scientifically, morally, it's just not the way. Right. And I, I think this really goes across many of those Western states that are, that are in a lot of the discussions that we've had, the, the Washingtons, the Idaho's, the Wyoming's, the Montana's now Colorado. This is a very big stretch of states and land that continue to have a lot of similar issues. Again, I think one of the keys to what Stephen, you said just before, and we've had many discussions about this is the negligence on the rancher who doesn't want to use the efforts to deter wolves from coming near his cattle and also not understanding the really the the wild aspect of where his cattle are grazing. So I think, I mean, we've spoken to Karen Vardaman and we've spoken to um, a few other individuals who are working with ranchers and Western landowners that are starting mm -hmm. to understand these practices can work as long as you keep doing it and you, some are starting to train their cows that are being born to act more like a natural, a quote unquote natural herd, like a bison herd, where if they see a predator coming in, going after their calves, they circle up and let's face it, I, I the majority of wolves, whether, even if you have a pack of 10, they're not gonna go after, you know, 20 cows that are, sit in a circle and are, and are face out. It just, the, the odds of them taking that <laughs> risk are slim to none. So 
there, mm-hmm. there are mm-hmm. what's 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 the impact here is that we see it's really just a negligence of saying I'm going to do it my way without trying to use these efforts, uh, whether it be flagery, whether it be fox uh, fox lights or, or fox boxes, and boxing in your cattle and having them graze in a certain area while still being able to a run your business and have and be economically sound and also Mm -hmm. keeping the wilderness wild and understanding that you can coexist i mean they've had you know sheep grazer sheep herd not herds whatever sheep yeah farms (laughs) or whatever it is sheep Yeah. yeah i guess and you know karen vardaman has come on and they have been wildly successful with sheep who were able to graze in these same areas where wild wolf packs are. And I think they, I think there was something, it was some outrageous, they they might've had, I think anywhere between five to 15 depredations over, I think five years, which is incredibly successful. That's pretty good. With sheep. Especially considering other things take way more cattle than that. Exactly. You're talking, you know, and that's not including coyotes, the bears, the lions, the coyotes, Stuff like that. So, so yes, like I mean, it's, airborne. I mean, uh, respiratory issues take a lot of a lot of respiratory cattle. too. Yeah, disease hit by cars. Right. I mean, these are all things. Carter Niemeyer has spoken about this multiple times. It's really, mm-hmm. it all goes back. And Julie, I'm sure you've seen this. And every all the work that you've done is that it really just goes back to the wolf being the symbol of this wild, the the most wild parts of wild, and also this villainous creature that can do no right. Yeah. I mean, I think that continues to be what those of us in the, in the community of, of trying to educate people about the value of wolf and the need for wolves and that wolves are, are the wilderness um, and need to be here. Um, Yeah. I think that we continue to be up against like pushing back against that old narrative, you know, and that narrative came up in, in Washington state. I mean, I think part of the narrative that was going on after they had killed some of the wolves, but they hadn't killed the rest of the wolf pack yet was something like, um, we don't want this kind of wolf pack in our state. It was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. These wolves are being wolves and they are living their lives in the wilderness, right? And you've got all these cattle that come in and disperse around their wolf den but you don't, you know, the talking point was we, these are bad wolves. You know, it's like, wait a minute, you know, that's kind of, you know, so I think that that kind of narrative continues to be pushed, you know, and it's the challenge is combating that. And I love what's happening in our community because I feel like a way to combat it is not necessarily pushing against it, but is trying, <laughs> trying to be, I don't want to say smarter because that sounds egotistic, but invent, uh, inventful, what is the word? Trying to be um, forward thinking, you know, yeah, yeah, big, yeah, big yeah. picture thinking. Problem, problem solving. Yeah, problem big solving, picture thinking, you know, yeah. Big, right. So now we're talking about restoration. Thank God. It's not just like good, bad, good wolf, bad wolf, you know? It's like, no, no. A lot of us now are talking about how, um, you know, we, you know, our environment, our ecology needs restoration and wolves are a part of that. So we need wolves, you know, for us to have healthy ecosystems. That's big picture thinking, not this small minded kind of like, oh, well, you know, there's these wolves are evil and they're going to kill, you know, but the numbers are still really small, you know, yeah, that they're wolves small. are taking. And you mentioned all these other things that come in and kill livestock and sheep, yeah, well you know, that. wolf depredation is still very small, but we still blow it up. You know, so in my mind, I'm I'm on board with like the rewilding groups and talking about restoration. And I think people in Colorado, and that's another reason why I felt honored to be asked to participate in this movement, right? There is a pretty big movement going on in Colorado that, you know, people have been in the trenches since the 90s, you know, can can, you know, people like Delia, Delia Malone is one of them, but you know, Mike Phillips and, and many others, you've probably talked to some, yep, but right. people have been planting seeds, planting these seeds since the nineties. But I think now they're finally getting to a point where they're trying to let people know, look, you know, we've got these areas of the wilderness that have been destroyed by overgrazing, you know, public lands that have been overgrazed, right? Well, guess what? 
you know, wolves help help to restore our ecosystems. And so to me, that's the big picture thinking that I want to get behind, not this low level kind of battle that we'll just keep, I don't know. I just, I don't feel like we're getting anywhere with it. And um, just taking like killing endangered wolves out of the picture is where I want to focus my attention and focusing more on how can we restore these systems that we as a culture Unfortunately, we got behind with our tax dollars and the people we voted for, you know, and, and, and what we've done with public lands. But we are we are really in a bad situation now with um, with how we've destroyed ecology. You know, we need to repair that. And wolves are a part of that. The one thing I, I wanted to ask you about today as I run, because I, I know we and it's all tied into this, is that why? Why animation for something with this much of a a direct link to you individually? Because I think most people would think visually looking at Wolves in the Wild or the films that you did, you know, looking at Medicine of the Wolf and people get that resonance with looking in a wild being, whatever it is, and they can connect there. Why did you feel so strongly about the animation aspect of it and feeling that that would translate in a way that is power, just as powerful as if you were to look at something that was shot through a camera lens? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I thought about this a lot because initially I think that's what the idea was for me to you know, create pictures and go out and film stuff or use footage that I had, et cetera. Um, to create something similar to what I had done before. But I thought, you can grow if you keep doing the same things you're doing. You know, okay, so part of it was, I want to keep growing as an artist. You know, I don't, I don't want to just, I don't want to be limited to like what I've done before. You know, um, that's in my mind, that's the easy way out. You know, it's like, I know better than to just stay in the same place as an artist. Yeah, I mean, I, I teach actors and stuff and I'm always talking about like, we have to get out of our comfort zones, you know? So like, I have to use my own uh, suggestions, right? So, okay, so part of it was stretching out, of getting out on a limb and, and stretching. That was part of it. But the bigger part was for sure, when I read the poem, I went, I don't want to just, <laughs> I don't want to just use video and and like do some kind of gunshot or either find footage of wolves being killed or do some kind of fake gunshot where the wolf is killed. You know, that's been done. I just don't want to do that. I don't feel something inside of me felt like that was not what I, I didn't want to convey something in a contrived way in that way. I wanted to, what I wanted to show in the animation was, um, I wanted to bring people into this family. And I thought animation could help the viewers be connected to the wolf family. Because if I just showed wolves and then showed video of wolves being killed, yeah, it's horrible. But how are we going to actually connect to the wolf family? You know, because I, I don't, I think people turn away. You know, I turn away for sure. If I know there's going to be violence, an animal's going to die, you know, I tend to tune out sometimes because it's just too heavy, right? I have a hard time just reading about something like that. So my goal with this animator was that they we brought we get brought into the world of this profanity peak family. We feel the forest, which is their house, their home, their world. I thought the animation could help us to feel their world more and feel what it's like to be this family to be connected and then destroyed, you know? So part of it was, um, I just think, you know, visual storytelling is so, um, uh, it's challenging to get what you want to get across if you're not like out and able to film the whole thing, you know, the scene, like, you know, you can with actors, you can film, you can film a whole scene and try to get it to play out in a way that moves people. But to film a wolf pack being killed, that's kind of hard. <laughs> you know, 
It, uh, the, yeah, I just felt like it was, and the, and the poem is very on the head. Like it really talks about like step by step and the wolves being killed. So I thought I need, I need to pull in something else, you know, another visual. Um, and it's still, I think it's still painful and hard for people to watch. You know, I've have heard some feedback about it, but um, I feel like what we were able to capture was um, this deep connection this wolf camp family had to each other you know, and that all of a sudden there's this really harsh reality happening in their world. You know, this, this forest is the wolf's world. You know, I think we forget that, you know, like, I think as human beings, like we're so, um, we claim ownership over everything, but I wanted people to feel the intimacy of their home in their forest. And then all of a sudden us humans kind of come in and just Smack it down and destroy it, you know. And and again, it's hard to that be hard to do with video. You guys probably know by now too. Like it's just hard to go out and film wild wolves, right? That's 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 a real challenge. And I didn't want to deal with like footage that had already been shot before of other wolves. I didn't I didn't feel like that was a way of honoring this particular pack. Right, they were, it should be they're, unique. They're a unique pack and a unique family. And so I thought visually with animation, maybe the intention of that would come through that it was about this family, not just any wolf family. Because I think we can get into trouble when we just see a bear and associate with every other bear. No, this wolf pack and this family had their relationship to each other and to their surroundings. Got it. Yeah. I love that though. That That's great. And I think that's a great angle that you, that, you took and that it, it seems to have obviously worked and people have viewed the film and, and the reception. I, I, from what I, everything I've read has been very, very positive. Um, what's the difference with that? You, you teamed up with your, your friend, Jim Brandenburg again on, on the wild one, which is the other project you were doing. Well, what's the difference with the wild one? Uh, Cause it seems like this is, back to a little bit of medicine of the wolf if i'm wrong on that uh just let me know but is how how did that one come about what were you talking with jim like how did you reconnect with jim and and what was the aim for for this one and for them to be done simultaneously almost simultaneously and then premiering at the same film festival what was what was this uh project like as compared to today as i run well, it was the same intention that I had with the other film, which was to assist, you know, um, the Colorado group, the Alliance, to um, educate Coloradans about wolves and how, you know, we need wolves on, on the landscape and uh, we don't want to bring wolves back and then hunt wolves. You know, the wolves are sentient animals um, that, you know, deserve to have a place uh, in Colorado to roam without being persecuted. So it's like, that was the goal. And what kind of stories can we tell to help keep to translate that message? And I instantly, when I was talking to, um, when I was talking to them about another idea for a video, I went, oh my God, wait a minute. So I read Jim Brandenburg's book, Brother Wolf. I don't know, um, back in 2014 when I was working on Brother Wolf and I discovered Jim Brandenburg's work and fell in love with all of his work photography and writing and filmmaking, but Brother Wolf changed me. A um, couple books changed me, but Brother Wolf changed me and how I looked at wolves and wilderness and wildlife and um, uh, of Wolves and Men by Barry Lopez really changed me as well. So um, Brother Wolf had a huge impact on me. And if you read Brother, Brother Wolf, um, it's like Jim, it's like Jim channeled the wolf. I mean, that's just the way it felt because he's speaking in as if he is the wolf, you know, it just came through him. And, um, and, and Jim's been out, you know, living with and studying wolves for, I don't know, I think it's like 50 years now, you know, on his land in Northern Minnesota and, uh, very, being very close to wolves. So his, um, 
you know, I consider the wolves on his property his friends. He really did. You know, that's the kind of person that Jim is. And that's the way that Jim is able to, um, I was with Jim one time, this is a little tangent, but I was with Jim one time, we were going to the airport, we stopped off at this little park, he wanted to show me something, we were standing there talking, this red, I think it was a red um, hawk, literally came down and almost sat on his um, shoulder. I am not kidding you. Like, that hawk was so drawn to him. I just stood back and I went, <laughs> like, there's like fairy dust around Jim when it comes to animals. It's just his energy. Anyway, I can see why, you know, um, he has this presence. It's just some people have it. Jim does. Anyway, so Jim Jim wrote this book called Brother Wolf. And um, and I when I when I created Medicine the Wolf, uh, I don't think I used any of it in uh, Medicine of the Wolf. There was just too many other things that, you know, in the editing process that came through. But I was holding on to his words from the book. And uh, I mean, I'd try to find little places to put the words into the film and they all got cut out. And I was like, oh, you know, you guys know as editors, like you can get really attached to certain things. And sometimes they just you have this one flow and this one story and you can love it or love the person or love the music or love the graphics. And it just breaks the flow. So I cut, you know, I cut out this one piece where I had this whole piece of Jim's, Jim's brother, brother wolf words. And so when we were talking about, Oh, what another video I went, ah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'd love to, you know, create this video uh, piece around it's, I mean, it's really like an ex, uh, experimental film. I guess that's, I, I guess that's what it is because when I submitted to film festivals, that's what they called it. So it's a, <laughs> I'm like, okay, the experimental film. So it's an experimental film around Jim Brandenburg's brother wolf words. And uh, it was an honor. I mean, the funny, not, it's not funny. The interesting thing about the words is it feel they feel so timely to me. And, you know, it's like the wolf is through, through Jim, the wolf is basically talking about how we're, I mean, we're just the stuff we were just talking about guys, how we are destroying our planet, you know? And um, as if, you know, the wolf was observing what humans have done, you know? And um, I felt like that message is, um, it's just so timely, you know, for us to kind of wake up, you know, wake up. He, he wrote this back in, I don't know, the 90s or something. And it was just jarring to me, like, how, I mean, I hate, I'm not, I'm trying, I don't want to be gloom and doom, but just how worse it's gotten in a lot of ways, you know, and, and climate change has accelerated a lot of things. So it was kind of like, it's really things that I want to say, you know, but I don't have that voice. You know, I'm not Jim Brandenburg. You know, I, I, I don't. I just. I don't feel like I can stand and shout that from the mountaintops from myself. But these are things that I'm so passionate about the words and the meaning and how important it is for us. Like you guys are saying with your podcast, like we need to get together, people. We need to try to come from a place of unity and togetherness because we've created these problems and we're the, we can only solve them together. You know, it's like, it's like, come on, man. You know, the world is exploding in a lot of ways, you know, but I love that it came through the wolf. <laughs> it came through the wolf, you know, in his book. So it was like, okay, I can get on board with that. Yeah. And not to mention the solutions are out there at this point, because there's genius people, you know, coming up with them and We've got the help there. It's just we gotta we have to ask for it and accept it in some way, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes you just need to like, yeah, exactly, right? There's a lot of people doing a lot of great things, you know. And I think that we continually need to um, inspire and and tell stories that help to wake up, you know, wake people up, activate their passion, activate their emotions to care, right? care about what's going on not to be passive you know yeah we need to be active yeah. totally mm-hmm. i mean you you've been being act you've been active in this arena for 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 a good while and it's everything that we we see of yours really just breathes i mean you eat sleep breathe it edit it now 
and <laughs> you know direct <laughs> and produce and all that if there's if there's one one thing julia that you want people to take away from today as i run and the wild one what are what's the one thing it can be obviously separate because they are two separate entities roughly for the same project but two different creative processes for you what's the one thing that you would say if someone were to watch these films that you want them to come out either feeling or 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 inspired to do Ah, uh, I think it goes back to, you know, the original conversations I had when we were creating these films uh, and the purpose behind them. And it is, uh, we don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. We're just going to get back to the same place we've always been, which is, mm-hmm. you know, we don't, we don't, um, we don't want to do in Colorado what we've been doing the rest of the country. Um, and, uh, and we want to learn from our from our mistakes. We want to grow from our mistakes. And, you know, just calling on people in Colorado um, to ask themselves, you know, can, will they, you know, can, will we value wolves? Can we value wolves as intrinsic sentient creatures? You know, can we learn how to value the wolf from that place? You know, that's what's, important right now in Colorado is understanding the deep intrinsic value of wolves and not making the mistake that we've made in the past with the Profanity Peak family. Um, And can we set wolves up to um, fulfill their ecological role, right, in restoring the natural balance? Can we rise to that occasion rather than setting up wolves to fail um, and I think we can, but I think it's going to take a continued effort to think big picture, think about restoration, think about re- rewild, rewilding and restoring ecosystems and that the wolf is just a key player of that big picture. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> no, you did. You did. You got it. <laughs> hey, listen. Restoration. Yeah. Restoration, maybe. That's, That's the what way we're to doing. Do it. We're restoring. Yes. we're restoring ecosystems. You know. Yeah. So where where can everybody see these 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 two films? Are they are they out for general release? Are they somewhere they can view them online? Where can we view today as I run the wild one? Is it coming soon to? Coming soon to theaters near near you. No, um, (laughs) thank you for asking. Right now, um, I'm waiting to hear, you know, I know we're having, there's been screenings in Colorado um, because again, it's part of this educational series that's going on with the um, Wolf Alliance. So um, Mm -hmm. I don't have any updates right now, but I'll I'll reach out and let you guys know when I do. And I think there may be a bigger screening um, in Colorado, but I don't have a date. I want to, I want to think it's in the fall, but I know there's going to be some kind of larger venue screening happening. Um, so I'll be excited to share that with you when I know. And right now there is on, uh, Sierra Club Colorado YouTube, um, channel, there's a trailer for Today As I Run. And, um, what else do I want to tell you guys? Yeah, and as soon as I hear anything about film festivals, I'll let you know as well. Yes, absolutely. So I, before we started, so both of the films have been accepted into the Minnesota International Film Festival. So if you're in Minnesota, when is that film festival, Julie? Is that coming up? So that already passed. Thank you. Oh, that already passed. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Never mind. yeah, that's okay. It's okay. Um, both films premiered at the Arizona International Film Festival. And then today as I run screened at Minneapolis International Film Festival in uh, May. And um, yeah, and like I said, there's going to be some more screenings in Colorado. I just don't have dates. Um, and you can follow me on, <laughs> you can follow me on Instagram because I am on Instagram now. And uh, I finally woke up and decided I need to get my act together. So I have an Instagram page and I will post things about screenings and things that I'm working on, et cetera. So feel free. It's director Julia Huffman. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, as I mean, obviously, obviously we have this connection, but Ju- uh, Julia does repost. She likes and she does share yeah, many things. So if you are in the wolf community, uh, I can tell you that yeah. she is a, a wonderful ally to have and a wonderful person to 
connect with and share things with. So that's, uh, I would definitely promote anything you want. Uh -huh, for Thanks, Julia. and I'm happy sure. to support. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, for sure. she's definitely on that. Uh, Julia, this is fantastic. I, we look forward to seeing when Stephen and I can see these eventually and when they do become available Can't on wait. these other film festivals or in Colorado, just let us know and we'll gladly shoot that out on our, our social media as well so that people can have a chance to view these beautiful films and, and see that. Be happy to. Yeah. And thanks for your support, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your support. And it's it's reciprocated both ways. We really appreciate you, Julia. And uh, thanks for being a mainstay with us and and being with us in the podcast from the beginning. We can't, can't thank you enough for that. Oh my God. And congratulations on 100. And I can't wait to see where this all goes. It looks like it's going in a really exciting direction and more will be revealed, as they say. Yes, yes, I love that. <laughs> A little teaser. Oh, man. Awesome stuff. Julia Hoffman, thank you so much. How's to all of you out there? And Stephen, I'll be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Looking to support Wolf Connection or sponsor one of the wolves in our pack? Just go to wolfconnection.org, click on the Donate tab, and find out more information. 